we're going to get into the next portion, which is our React video. And we found a video where someone's talking about saving up for a uh, purchasing a house in today's housing environment. And they call Dave Ramsey to try and figure out what it is they should be doing. We think our answer is different from Dave's. And I think that our answer is better than Dave's. But I'll let you decide that. Let's just check out the video and find out. Well, hi, Josh. How are you? Doing great. How are you doing, Dave? Better than I deserve. What's up? So a question for you. My wife and I have a household income of just over 100000 and we're completely through baby steps one through three. And I'm wondering how, with the current house market, we don't have a home, are saving up for a home, how do baby steps four and five change for us? Why would they change? Well, we are just saving up for a home and working towards that down payment. We're almost ready for the down payment. Okay, I, I don't make it a secret that George is probably the personality on Dave Ramsey's show that bugs me the most. And step number six for Dave Ramsey is pay off your home early. So if you don't have a home, that is a little bit confusing. And what the caller is asking about is like, hey, for we finished step three, which is, you know, save enough for three to six months of an emergency fund. And now we're looking at investing 15% of our household income into retirement. But instead of doing that, we want to, you know, put it into a house. We want to purchase a house. And George is like, why would that matter? <laughs> okay, George. The thing we call baby step 3B. I have heard a little bit, yes. Okay, that's what you're talking about, I think. Okay, so you finish your emergency fund at three. That is the point at which you would begin to save for your home. And some people push pause and don't do four and don't start saving for retirement until they build their fully, until they get their house down payment. Some people mm -hmm. save for a house while they're putting something in retirement up to 15%. All right, we talked about this in last week's episode in the review is that I have a hard time with considering your house as a part of your retirement, your net worth for retirement, especially if you plan on not taking debt out against your house or you're not going to sell it and use that income, you know, that that capital gain somehow. And if you don't do those two things and a, a commenter pointed out on one of our shorts is that because I gave this example, if you have a million dollar or a hundred thousand dollar home and you have a $10 million home, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If you're not going to use the equity in those homes, if you're not going to move and you're not going to take out debt, it could, it doesn't matter what value your home is. It doesn't change your retirement plan. And someone commented, and it was a really good comment, which is like, well, technically speaking, the $10 million home will actually be significantly more expensive in retirement because you have property taxes, insurance will be way higher, upkeep is way higher. So that is actually more concerning. The more net worth you have in your home, if you don't plan on selling it, if you don't plan on taking out uh, any debt against it, the more net worth your home is actually worth, the higher impact that will have on your retirement. So when Dave is talking here about like, you know, you could pause this retirement savings and retirement investing and go buy a home. I struggle with that because let's do it that. You know, if younger me came to me and was like, hey, AJ, you know, how should I start setting this stuff up? The first thing I would try and figure out is like, all right, so, you know, inflation adjusted, what are you trying to, you know, get as income in the future? What's going to be the thing, the amount of money that you're going to need at a retirement point? And then I would figure out backwards, like, okay, so if you're using the 4% rule, that means that we can withdraw 4% of our entire portfolio every year and be safe for 30 years at, at the minimum. Or yeah. So, if I took that rule and I said, okay, so how much per year? And then how much would I need in order for that 4% to get taken out? That's how much I need at retirement. And then I would tell that younger version of myself, um, you're going to need to start investing this much if we can expect a certain amount of compound interest to get there by retirement so that you can have that much money. That amount of investing would be unrelated to your personal home. Right. So you could say like, you know, my personal home, I'm going to have paid off. So I'm going to have less expenses in retirement, which is awesome, which means you need less income, but you still need to get to that retirement amount. Whatever your retirement amount is, you're going to need to get to that. And if you're buying a house is ruining that goal, you're doing it wrong. And so the fact that Dave's not pointing this out, like, hey, look, dude, 
Like, you know, you could put money into your personal house all day. Let's say our $10 million house dollar house example. Let's buy the max house we could possibly get. Let's stretch ourselves as thin as humanly possible. Let's buy that house. We'll chuck a huge down payment at it. And then when we hit retirement, we have $200,000. We're going to be forced to sell our home. I mean, that, that is the only answer, right? So you can do either one or both somewhere in there. So how long is this going to take to save up your down payment? Uh, we're you have a specific thinking, goal? So we're, we're thinking mid next year, we're going to have uh, a little bit larger down payment than is required. And we're doing 8% of our household income into Roths right now. Okay. And so while doing 8%, you'll still have that down payment by mid next year. Yeah, we're putting away 8% into the Roths and about 40% of savings just goes away into CDs until we're ready for a down payment. That's fabulous, Josh. Well done. Yeah, that's what we would call baby step 3B. So 3B okay. is all of your savings goes into um, into your house down payment fund up or down to a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less than all because you're putting some or up to 15% into retirement. So you're putting eight into retirement and you're still going to make your down payment goals. Doesn't change a thing. It's exactly what I would do. Have at it. Okay. And then would you hold off at all until interest rates come down nope. or just when we get that down payment ready? No, nope. buy a house when you're ready. Okay. Because here's the thing. If interest rates come down after you buy the house, refinance. Okay. House prices aren't coming down. We've not seen substantial drops in house prices ever in the real estate market except during the 2008 debacle. And we're not going to see them now. We've told you this for two years because we've still got a shortage of housing. There's not enough inventory. Too many buyers chasing too few items causes price to maintain stability or go up. So house prices are going to be going up. And I wouldn't sit around and watch the house prices go up while I'm waiting on interest rates to go down. So he's rightish. Um, I would. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna address the what, what I think he should do with his money. I think he's killing it. You know, eight percent into a Roth IRA. Um, for those who don't know, that's pre-taxed investments where you get to take out everything that you've gained tax-free when you retire. It's probably the most powerful, you know, financial cheat code right now is Roth IRA um, and 401k match. Those two. So I think he's doing great there. Um, and then he's taking 40% and saving it for a house. He's killing it. Like, and I'm going to address what I think he should do with that. As far as houses, we've have seen a housing price drop, especially like I live in the Bay area in California. We've seen like a, at least a 20% drop here. There's drops other places. There's expected to be more drops. And the reason is because Dave's right on the first half, which is like, there's not a lot of sellers. People aren't selling. Cause the problem is you bought a home in like 2019 for like a two point one percent interest rate or something 2.0 percent interest rate and you can't ever go anywhere else like if you were to sell that house that you bought even though the equity increased on it and turn around and take that over to a house that you could afford um you're because the interest rates have gone way up you'd it'd be like a lateral move right you're like the monthly payment you would have would be like the same and the house would be either the same or worse in order to maintain that so it doesn't make sense right now for people to be moving so because of that there's not a whole lot of people selling but also there's not a whole lot of people buying because interest rates are so high and the house prices have not fallen you're seeing stuff where it's like you know the basic house in like san jose california is going to cost you like thirteen thousand dollars a month who has thirteen thousand dollars a month engineers here who are getting paid well don't have thirteen thousand dollars a month that's a crazy number so because of that we're not seeing a huge amount of buyers so yes there's not a huge amount of sellers there's also not a huge amount of buyers housing prices have fallen somewhat they do look like they're being pulled down you know on a month-to-month -month basis they kind of go up and then down again but overall they're 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 still sliding downwards and if, if we hit a point where like you know a lot of people are losing jobs and they're struggling which is exactly what the federal reserve wants or inflation goes up to the point where people cannot afford to live on the job that they had before and things are too expensive including their mortgage we're going to start to see people having to sell even if they don't want to and we're going to start to see foreclosures and I think that we're slowly getting there. If you remember last or two weeks ago, I had DC on, we were talking about how low the savings rate was and how high the debt and credit card rate was. We're getting you know, closer and closer to this like breaking point where people just won't be able to survive 
on what they have and they're going to have to be put into a position to reclaim the equity in their home. If enough people have to do that, that's what a crash happened. So 2008, enough people had to try and reclaim their equity and they had to do it all at once because of a you know particular event that occurred where the economy faltered a little bit and bam, all those houses hit. We might see something um, going on like that. We're, we're seeing increases in foreclosures. Uh, SoFi, after a period of historic lows, foreclosure rates in the U.S. are once again on the rise. According to property data from Adam, the number of houses units with foreclosures filings in March was 36,600, a nearly 10% increase from the previous year. So you have a 10% increase on foreclosures that can't be good. And at some point, there's got to be a break. So when Dave keeps sitting here and saying, like, you know, houses won't go down, houses won't go down, they have gone down, and we pointed that out. And he changed his language. He was like, houses don't go down for too long. And then now, you know, we're showing you, yeah, there's some uncertainty here. So if it was me, um, I don't know what I would do here. I Like, it's, it's tricky. If I had to buy a house right now, you know, should I wait a year? It could get worse in a year. It could get better in a year. It, it's always hard to know what's going to happen in the future. I prefer to put myself in a situation where I'm not required to make that decision and I can wait until the moment is exactly right and then strike when it's right. Right. So, you know, kind of give, you know, a little opening there for that. And um, I've got some more thoughts on that, but we'll, we'll get back in. I don't time the stock market or the real estate market. Both, exactly. Both involve some risk. And here's the, the, the only time I would time the real estate market is if I can't find a deal when I'm buying investment property. And then wait. Because the market's like white hot and there is no deals. I'm just don't buy unless I get a good, good deal. Pure. Dave's right on that. And George saying, I don't time the real estate market. George has bought like a house. Like a, like one time. Like you haven't timed anything, dude. Get out of here. These are like no life experience and he talks like he knows everything. That's why he drives me the most crazy. I can't stand it. Period. I do not buy investment property unless I steal it. Period. I want to get a great buy on investment property. Your money's made at the buy on that. But as far as your personal residence goes, buy when you're ready, which is when you're debt free, have your emergency fund in place and have saved your down payment. Yeah. And I get interest rates have got people freaked out because, you know, it's hundreds of dollars more in your payment. And they're going, well, I need to wait. The problem, like you're saying, Dave, is those same people are going to call us and say, Dave, I waited and now the home price is 100000 more than it was. Well, and there's no guarantee interest rates come down. I it mean, we just up. saw the, the Fed I mean, just... What if you sat around and waited and they went to 10? Yeah, they just raised the rates again. So we just don't know. In 1978, September, I got my real estate license. I was 18. That was the year interest rates went from nine and three quarters to 10% for the very first time ever. And if it did it then, and then it went on up to 18 before it came back down, and it took it a decade to do that reversal, to go on up and then back down. Uh, if it did it then, why can't it do it now? I mean, I don't know. These, these bozos continue to screw with this. They're, they're going to mess it up. I mean, so I wouldn't be sitting around waiting on the outside environment to get you ready. You get ready, strike while the iron's hot. So that's the end of the video. So, okay, so I got to lay in my solution. He's right there at the investing bit on the back. It's, um, you you know, you run the numbers for your investing plan for real estate and I can link to it. I, I did an episode where I showed how I run the numbers for stuff and you go find something that works for those numbers. And if that, if you find a deal that works and you put it in and someone comes and overbids you, but that overbid is outside your, you know, range, Oh, well, you skip it. You move on to the next one. Because like the investing thing is not about like, oh, I'm emotionally tied to this property. It's about like making sure those numbers actually work. But here's my thing. And this is my strategy. And I've kind of been vindicated recently because the guy who does that get rich show on Netflix, let's see how to, how to get rich by Ramit. I think that's his name, Ramit. Um, he kind of indicated my thing too, which was like, you know, at the end of the day, one of like the first baby step that we teach is, Figure out what your net worth number is. Every time you make a financial decision, you make that decision based off of what impacts that, that net worth number the least or what grows that net worth number the greatest over time. And that's how you kind of focus your mindset around what you do with money. And then as that goes on, like you will have the opportunity to make decisions on purchasing homes and stuff, right? But if you go into it in the mindset of like, oh, I want a home because it's a good investment. Oh, I want a this because it's a good investment. I'm going to spend money over here because it's a good investment. You're not paying attention to that net worth number and you're not focusing on how to grow that number. You're going to end up being in a position where like you could be house wealthy, but not 
wealthy, like not retirement wealthy. You're not going to hit your goals. You're not going to be figuring that stuff out. One of my favorite sayings was, um, you know, focus on your net worth and cash will come. But if you focus on your cash, it's your net worth is never going to be there. And I, I believe that that's true. And that's why we put net worth as the first baby step that we have. So focus on building that net worth number and you'll get the cash. You'll have the cash to be able to purchase a home. This dude is investing like 48% of his income. It's like 40% is going into savings and 8% is going into a Roth IRA. If he was to start investing 48% of his income within, you know, 10 years, he's going to be in a place where he could like purchase a home, no problem. And it's, it's not going to impact his net worth like at all. Right. But as of right now, what he's doing could impact his net worth greatly because he's more focused on the home than he's focused on actually building his net worth. And so if I was, you know, if this was me asking me this question, what I would do is invest this money. Like, don't worry about where it's going. Invest the money. Live as cheaply as you can. Get to 50%. You're already at 48. Get to 50% of investing and invest you know, over this next decade, as hard as you can, every raise that you get, every bonus you get, chuck that into investments. I would put thing, I'd put my money into things like the um, index funds against the S and P 500. Um, you know, whole market index funds is broad based already. And then after a while, I would start getting into some real estate. And if you get into real estate in your area, you have a good area for that. You could put yourself into a position where one of those properties ends up becoming your home. So I think that's what I would do. Focus on that net worth number. This guy could be extremely wealthy and could have the home of his dreams at some point. And I think that hyper-focusing on that as your goal right now is going to end up damaging you later in retirement as you have less actual net worth, usable net worth, like not stuck in a home. So if you disagree with that, let me know. I'd be interested to know like where the disagreements are here. I think this is nuanced. Obviously, he's in a great place if he could save enough cash within a year or, or a little bit more than a year, I think he said, to put a big down payment on a home. He's, he's in a good spot. He's putting in 58, uh, 48%. So if you got a different idea, let me know. But I really think he should be investing hard and we'll worry about the home later. And uh, I think that will give him the best outcome. Mm -hmm.